hello good evening everyone uh, are we all set in for the next session i think uh, so diving now straight into this session uh, named military heritage and history i would like to invite panelists anisha shekhar mukherjee uh, professor anuradha chaturvedi uh, and uh, professor amar faruqi on the dais so as i just mentioned uh, the topic of this session is military heritage and history so this panel delves into the fascinating architectural and cultural legacy of one of india's iconic monuments centered around uh, anisha shekhar mukherjee's uh, acclaimed book the red fort of shah jahanabad an architectural history uh, I, i invite you to join us for a captivating discussion moderated by renowned historian professor Amar Farooqi that offers rare insights into life within the palace fortress of Shah Jahanabad one of the seven historic cities of Delhi commissioned by the Mughal emperor Shah Jahan over to you uh, professor Farooqi thank you so uh, today uh, this afternoon we have a very distinguished panel Uh, which we'll be discussing uh, the red fort its history its architecture uh, and uh, problems of uh, conservation uh, which are in fact quite uh, specific to uh, the red fort for reasons which i think most of you are aware uh, and uh, uh, i'll begin by saying something about uh, anisha ji's uh, uh, book on the red fort Uh, for a lay person like me uh, this book is indeed uh, a revelation and uh, it's a revelation because uh, we think we know a lot about the red fort but uh, uh, without a, an understanding of its layout its design architecture uh, the usage of various parts of the fort it's very difficult really to uh, make sense of a lot of the history of that uh, fort it's a long history uh, it still continues it's a live uh, uh, fort and uh, so it uh, remains uh, and it remains very important to uh, the uh, the uh, symbol of the uh, independent indian nation uh, anisha ji's book uh, is uh, remarkable for the way in which she has uh, made use of a wide a range of archival material maps uh, archaeological survey uh, diagrams uh, records uh, to piece together a very lucid and uh, coherent account of uh, uh, a monument which has actually a very difficult uh, history which has a very difficult history uh, and i'll just say a few uh, things about uh, you know raise, raise one or two issues about uh, that history to place the discussion in context so uh, we know that um, the so w- one point which i think is important uh, particularly since we this is uh, a military heritage uh, festival we need to underline that the f- main function of a fort is a military function and uh, this is uh, an important consideration in the design of the fort the finer points of the architecture will of course uh, anisha ji will i will request her to say something about that but i think you know one of the aspects which comes comes out very very clearly in the book is uh, the way the actual location of uh, what she calls the private and public imperial domain uh, which is placed at uh, uh, a part in a part of the fort which is uh, uh, almost inaccessible so uh, it would uh, have uh, of course uh, the uh, defensive functions uh, but at the same time it also increased in a way the mystique of the emperor who is not uh, uh, so easily visible of course there's the jaroka from which the emperor is supposed to be visible but then there is also the mystique of the emperor which is emphasized by that uh, distance uh, we need to also keep in mind that uh, the uh, f- changes in the fort uh, shah jahan was uh, occupied the fort for just about 10 years after it had been built 
and uh, towards the end of his reign and uh, the changes in the fort which uh, went on for a long period of time commenced with uh, 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 the accession of Aurangzeb while Shah Jahan was still uh, alive. So one of the first things that he does is while Shah Jahan is still alive is the construction of the curtain or the barbican uh, in front of two of its uh, gates, uh, which apparently Shah Jahan was uh, very critical of. But, uh, and then of course, and then uh, Aurangzeb himself is here for some time, for a couple of years, but then for the last 30 years of his reign, he is absent from Delhi, so it's unoccupied. Uh, another 15 or 20 years when the upheavals of the post-Aurangzeb period uh, occur, Again, the fort is more or less unoccupied. So for the first 50 years of uh, uh, its reign, except for the first few years, first decade or 15 years, uh, it's occupied. And then for almost half a century, uh, the emperor is not there. And then 1739 is a big catastrophe with the coming of Nadir Shah. That's uh, one sort of major blow to the fort. But I won't sort of trace the longer history, but come straight to the latter half of the 18th century, to, I think, make a point which uh, is made by Anishaji, but I think which needs to be emphasized, which is that uh, unlike the image that we have of an effete uh, uh, Mughal monarchy, uh, you know, uh, towards, uh, towards the end of the uh, century, uh, languishing in uh, prison, uh, in, 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 in their sort of fort prison, uh, in fact, uh, they were, they took a great deal of interest in ensuring that uh, a semblance of uh, uh, order was restored to the fort almost after uh, a gap of nearly uh, 70 to 80 years. Uh, Shah Alam himself, despite that, uh, uh, you know, the blinding of uh, Shah Alam, that's the sort of really traumatic uh, event, 1788, when uh, he's, he is uh, blinded. And <clears throat> but after that, the next 70 years till the revolt are a period when the when Shah Alam in the remaining years of his life, his uh, successor Akbar Shah and then Bahadur Shah, they take a great deal of interest in ensuring that whatever limited resources they have, they are able to uh, you know, uh, uh, restore some of the glory of the fort. Of course, the old Shah Jahan fort is no longer possible. Uh, there's so much construction that takes place within the fort which uh, uh, to make place for, for people who reside there. But I think, uh, uh, it's important, I mean, it's striking that uh, uh, Shah, uh, Bahadur Shah uh, does uh, make the effort to uh, construct some buildings, the, uh, the Zafar Mahal, for instance, uh, whatever its architectural merit, uh, the Zafar Mahal is uh, a construction which uh, I think uh, is, uh, tells us something about uh, the, uh, the, the way in which Bahadur Shah saw the fort and his own role in ensuring that the fort uh, remained uh, uh, orderly. And then, of course, there's 1857. The two points quickly which I'd like to make about 1857, uh, one is that when, this, when, the, when the rebels come to the fort, they occupy a large part of the fort, and they, uh, from whatever archival material we have, it seems that the, uh, the uh, soldiers were not uh, uh, a disorderly, unruly mob. They were very careful about the areas which they could uh, uh, sort of uh, intrude into and areas from which they had to keep away. So uh, the archival record would suggest they never ventured into the most private areas of the imperial zone, which meant the areas of the interior of the palace where the women resided. Those were areas which uh, uh, they never really sort of intruded into. And I was so, uh, I mean, this was confirmed by a map, a, a drawing that uh, is there in, in the book on page 267 uh, of uh, the areas in which the soldiers uh, intrude, the Indian Sipahis, the rebel Sipahis, and that is the area which she leaves unshaded, which tells us a lot about, you know, which confirms this impression that we have. And then, of course, there's the large-scale destruction of the fort in the post-1857 uh, period by the British. A uh, uh, very large part of the fort is demolished. Never, it can never be recovered again. Uh, those portions which have been destroyed, particularly the, 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 the 
you know, women's uh, seraglio, the, uh, some of those areas uh, can never really be uh, uh, retrieved. Uh, and that brings me to uh, an important concern of our discussion, the slow restoration and recovery of the fort, which began toward the end of the 19th century, early 20th century, and uh, is still an ongoing process. And probably uh, we can uh, request uh, Anisha ji to first say something about the book. Then we can have a discussion about the problems of its uh, uh, restoration. So uh, Anisha ji. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Faruqi, for your kind words. and. Uh, to, to the USI for organizing this, and to Professor Anuradha Chaturvedi for coming here. Um, Professor Faruqi has touched upon a lot of concerns um, that are there in the book. What I'd like to do today is um, speak about certain aspects in the book, and I've got some images to make it, uh, you know, uh, a little more, uh, uh, to, to visualize what, what is happening. So if, with your permission, I'll First, just go through that, and uh, which perhaps will touch upon what I think are the most important aspects of the fort that we should uh, be also considering. Um, so, I, yes. Okay. So, okay. I can I can move it with this, or do I? Uh, no, no. They are moving it. You can tell them to uh, like the slides. The slides are the podium. Oh, the slides are that side. But you can see them over there. Right. So you just have to keep okay. telling the next right. slide. So, um, yeah, so this is, so let me just. Oh. <laughs> right. Is that okay? So I'm, I'll, um, I'll take about uh, 10 odd minutes to just run through what I think is, is important. And uh, as we all know, as Professor Faruqi has also just kind of encapsulated for us, the Red Fort has had a very long and checkered history through the almost 400 years of its existence. I've uh, written about them at length in the book, and um, in the 10 odd minutes, 10 to 12 minutes I have today, I'll just focus on what I believe are the most important and least understood parts of its story, uh, which are the logic and attributes of its original design, and how that embodies military heritage, among other aspects. So the first thing I'd like to underline is that we cannot see this building complex as just a fortification. It is um, quite unlike garrison or frontier forts, or even the popular image of uh, you know, dramatic forts atop craggy peaks. It was built as an urban fort complex, along with its contemporary city of Shah Jahanabad, at the height of the political power of Shah Jahan in the second dec decade of his reign as we all know, and in that capacity, the Red Fort did, of course, contain urban military functions. But if that sounds rather too prosaic, we must also recollect that the Red Fort has been eulogized as the most magnificent palace in the East, perhaps in the world, not by what may be constituted as the biases of Mughal writers, but by the pioneering British architectural historian James Ferguson in his monumental history of Eastern and Indian architecture. However, though magnificent it certainly was, the Red Fort was not just a palace either. In addition to being the Mughal emperor's personal residence and that of his large extended family, it contained many other functions it was a cultural and urban focus of the city, a center of patronage of the highest arts and music, as well as an important factor in the economy of the entire empire. It contained within it administrative halls, courts of justice, karkhanas, markets, reception areas, orchards, formal gardens, dwellings of attendants, soldiers, and much, much more. So in other words, it had multiple functions. And it worked as a miniature city within a city. In the tradition of other large urban forts of this time, such as Agra and Lahore. However, unlike these other urban forts, instead of being commissioned piecemeal by different rulers, 
The Red Fort was unique in that it was conceived as a composite whole along with its supporting city. Thoughtfully planned with deliberation and with underlying guiding principles to simultaneously satisfy its various functions, the Red Fort was the grand finale to imperial Mughal urban forts, just as the Taj Mahal, which was a contemporary act of patronage by Shah Jahan, was the grand finale to imperial Mughal tombs. As I see them, the principles underlining the design of the Red Fort complex are one, optimization of space, infrastructure, energy, resources. Two, consideration for the context and conditions of its time and place. And third, flexibility and permeability in the detail and use of its architecture. So I'll explain these directing principles and how the military function of the fort was achieved within them with the help of some images from the book. And, yes. So this is, um, it's a map from the 1840s. And um, it has one of the most detailed available representations of the Red Fort, which uh, there's a close up in the next slide. And um, now, naturally enough, this is 200 years uh, after the fort's establishment in 1648 CE, and there have been changes within and around the fort, including the construction of secondary gateways uh, in the time of Aurangzeb, in front of the main entrances, the moving away of the Yamuna River, the appropriation of buildings and gardens by the British, who we must remember are already part of the city by then, but nonetheless, the fort's overall planning and organization were not altered. And a key attribute of this planning and organization was the way in which buildings and open spaces were connected to each other. They were devised as a series of walled forecourts, streets, and gardens that were disposed around a succession of buildings. And, um, what I've done is that in this plan of the fort, the open spaces have been colored black and the, the built spaces are white. So you can see the, uh, the close relationship between built and open space and how built space encloses and defines open space. And this uh, did a couple of things. First, it allowed the fort to be used in multiple ways and in different seasons and occasions. Usable space was extended through awnings, and the surrounding forecourts and gardens accommodated more people if occasion demanded. And this is Muhammad Sharangila playing holy in one of the pavilions. This also helped to derive maximum benefit from the Yamuna to create a favorable microclimate for living. To appreciate how such an organization helped to optimize space and infrastructure in the context of its time and place, in an incredibly efficient way, we can compare it with um, the kind of functions which are now carried out in the Rashtrapati Bhavan, North and South Blocks, Parliament House, Cantonment, Mandi House, Crafts Museum, etc. So all of these were combined within the fort itself, and uh, this is part of a panorama of the fort which shows you some of the kind of uh, detail and complexity of the kind of spaces and functions within it. And on analyzing the proportions, the sizes, and the locations of the buildings and the open spaces, we discovered that there was a definite geometry that linked them formally through an organizing system of grids. And that's a drawing that, uh, that I made which uh, explains that. So that's all very well, but one may ask um, how how is this related to the military function of the fort? And in fact, it appears at first glance that the security of the fort was insufficiently attended to and even compromised by such a planning and architecture. For instance, the emperor's palaces in the forts were close to the river, and instead of being towering closed buildings, they were interspersed with arcaded verandas and open-to-sky marble terraces. 
Unlike the rest of the fort edges, which were located behind high walls with continuous walkways patrolled by soldiers, these palace pavilions were built right atop the fort walls on the Yamuna banks. Within them, there were areas where the emperor displayed himself to public view at fixed times every single day. Each morning after sunrise, he sat at the palace window, the Jharokai Darshan facing the river banks. After that, he dispensed justice, surveyed parades, dealt with petitions and ambassadors and envoys from his throne in the Jharoka balcony in the Divaniya, the hall of public audience. And this balcony was in direct access with the main ceremonial entrance street to the fort and its Lahori gate. And further on to a great chalk just outside the fort walls and the main urban street of Shah Jahanabad. So the Red Fort was spatially, culturally, and socially integrated with its city and surroundings. But contrary to conventional perception, all this actually worked well in providing security. So the fort's complex sequence of pavilions set within a series of walled forecourts and gardens were not merely intended to generate an awe-inspiring aesthetic experience or just create a comfortable living experience. They additionally constituted multiple rings of secure enclosures around the emperor. His private imperial domain within the fort, where he and his family stayed, was normally disallowed to other occupants. It had its own walled forecourts and arcades, as we can see in this drawing, and these separated the emperor's movement routes from those of other occupants. It was extremely difficult to enter the imperial quarters without permission. Within the rest of the fort, too, areas of different occupants were separated into different domains where everyone moved through specific passages in a sequence of walled forecourts after passing through carefully positioned and guarded drawbridges and towering gates set in the high western and southern walls. And you can see them in, in this picture. So protected by moats, these boundaries um, were towards the northwest. They had additional security. And here we had the older 16th century strategic island fort of Salimgarh established by Salim Shah Suri. The soldiers stationed in the Red Fort had their living quarters adjacent to Salimgar, which was used as a stronghold and a prison connected by a solitary bridge to the Red Fort. There were stables and patrolling walls which ran continuously along the boundary. And this ring of high boundary walls and sequences of forecourts had strict regulations about who could enter and how these were to be entered, whether on horseback or on foot, with or without swords or entourages, even blindfolded. Uh, the French traveler and physician, Francois Bernier, uh, relates a story when he was summoned to examine a patient in the emperor's family, and he was led blindfolded through the fort. Now, the number of complexity of these four courts kept increasing as one moved in closer to where the emperor stayed and they formed a labyrinth almost, which completely disoriented new visitors and was very difficult to penetrate even for habitual users. If by chance or connivance, anyone did get in, to leave without being discovered was almost impossible, as happened reportedly to a young man during the reign of Aurangzeb. And when the emperor made his public appearances, he did so only within designated areas, in screened chambers at higher levels, separated from those around by railings and pillars, which allowed him to be viewed but not physically approached. Now, this miniature painting is, of course, from the Agra fort, but you get a sense of how the emperor is visible and, um, but yet separate from those around him. The eastern side of the fort, without a moat, had um, it was safeguarded in, in similar ways. It didn't have external walls, it didn't have forecourts, but the palace pavilions here were on much higher ground from the riverbank, and their few windows were filled in with intricate jalis. The verandas and arcades were away from the river face. And there is a picture of that, but I think that's uh, a little further away. So when we come to that, I'll draw attention to it. And uh, the emperor had his own gateway, for his private entry and exit from the banks, but this also did not lead directly to any of the pavilions, 
but instead to a series of narrow internal forecourts negotiated under strict surveillance. So there were these architectural devices of allowing visual connection, but limiting physical access through different layers, heights, and levels. And this, in a sense, is a continuation of the principle of controlled access achieved at a site level through the multiple forecourts within forecourts. So this is also one of the reasons that textual and visual descriptions of the fort are contradictory or incomplete. And um, yes, this is, this is an image of the river face of the fort where you can see that it's sitting directly on the river banks, but high above them. And this, uh, these are two maps which show you the Nakkar Khana forecourt, which is one of the main uh, orienting points in, in the fort. And you see that it's, they've been presented with different proportions. Um, this is a map from the India Office Library where the entire fort is shown as an empty space. Just its outer boundaries are uh, indicated with some buildings. And this is a map by Ensign Peter Lotti, which only shows the areas that he moved through. And because of the, the walled forecourts, the rest of the fort was invisible to him, and so he just shows it as a blank. Now, um, so what happens, therefore, is that the designed form of the fort, it works well, as I've explained, to satisfy multiple functions, including that of security and defense, and till there's political and military power to back it. But uh, for instance, in the mid 17th century, we have Taverna uh, speaking about the fact that till the emperor arose from his throne in the Divaniam, nobody was allowed to leave. And um, Mughal chronicles relate how the ex-king of Kashgar, when he visited the fort in 1688 CE, he was allowed to enter on horseback only till the doors of the forecourt to the Divaniam. And then he had to get down, uh, board a palki, and then proceed on foot till the hall, and then there were multiple silver and golden railings, and finally he's allowed only to come up to the foot of the throne balcony. But even after 1803, when the British took over administrative and fiscal control, and later even moved in their commandant of guard above the Lahori Gate, the rules controlling the use of the fort and its forecourts continued, and they offered a um, measure of security and privacy to the emperor. So for instance, uh, even the chief representative of the British in Delhi, the resident, he was not allowed to ride into the forecourts. And uh, on one instance when this happens, when Francis Hawkins, one of the British residents, has the temerity to do so, uh, the palace affairs are removed from under his jurisdiction. So they're taken very seriously, uh, even at that time. So all these things, the siting of the fort, the allocation of the functions within it, its buildings and forecourts, the rules governing its use, they're all vital components of its tangible and intangible military heritage. But um, all this transformed radically after 1857, and um, here we have the river face of the fort, and more than 85% of the original design of the fort was looted, demolished, and um, destroyed as a planned reprisal by the British in and after 1857, and I've spoken about this at length in the book, but also what happens is that the expulsion and the execution and exile of the Mughal rulers and almost the entire original population of the Red Fort and its subsequent occupation by the British military reduces the fort to virtually a shell and erases its multiple functions as well as its connected forecourts and buildings. And this is a drawing of the fort where, if you remember the, the first drawing that I showed you where the buildings, uh, a similar exercise was done to the original design of the fort, and you can see how the buildings now are marooned in a, in a kind of sea of open space. So all this was destroyed, and then the eventual restoration was initiated about half a century after its destruction. This was primarily catalyzed by the need to use the fort for state functions. Uh, for British imperial state functions, such as King George V's visit when he comes into the fort and presents himself to, to the people from the emperor's balcony. The intention was not to reinstate the original functions and use of the fort, and therefore the conservation effort fails to communicate the vital relationship and principles of its unique original design that underlay all its functions, and that's the way it exists even today. So, why is it that we are not told any of this at the fort today? 
and I've again uh, written about this in the book, but here I'd just like to state that we can still read evidence of the destroyed Mughal buildings in the British barracks, constructed from the rubble and fragments, and here you can see portions of the plinth, you know, the sandstone plinth. This is a close-up of one of the barracks. But this evidence, um, which is, you know, it can be used for its historical value, it can be interpreted to add another layer to its military heritage as part of good conservation practice, uh, but that hasn't happened so far. And neither is the stellar role of the Indian army in the history of our nation, and the headquarters of which were briefly located in the fort in 1947, communicated in any way today. So uh, it's very interesting that the battalion of the Indian Army, which was posted in the Red Fort for ceremonial and security reasons, coincidentally they operated from the, uh, from the southwestern and the northwestern and the southeastern parts, which is the area that the Mughal military also used. So in a sense, that was the only continuing historical use of the fort, uh, which, was, which, which stopped after the Indian Army was asked to vacate it. And that's unfortunately also been accompanied by great degradation of the overall appearance and upkeep of the fort. Um, this is the emperor's private entrance, what used to be his private entrance, where he entered the fort uh, when it was inaugurated, and uh, it's in a very bad state. And uh, these are, this is part of the Delhi Gate, and um, this is part of the Chata Chok uh, Gateway as well. So the condition of the Mughal buildings has also worsened, and they are the sole surviving examples of its unique design, we have to remember. So to end, I'd just like to reiterate that the iconic value of the Red Fort in shaping the very identity of the entire subcontinent stems from the fact of its establishment as an urban fort complex during Shah Jahan's time. Its relationship with the Mughal rulers after that with the War of 1857, its subsequent occupation by the British military, its association with the Indian Army, with Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose's rousing slogan to the Indian National Army, with the INA trials, which invested with multiple aspects of military heritage are all an outcome of that fact. And there's thus a great deal to be done if the value of the fort is a cultural icon as well as its symbolic and actual military associations are not to be jeopardized. For this, um, first, it's absolutely essential to communicate the logic and principles of its original design and expand our understanding of what constitutes military heritage. Secondly, how and why it transformed into you know, the strange cohabitation of British and Mughal structures. And thirdly, what does the fort mean for the heritage of independent India? And indeed for the entire world because it's, it has outstanding universal values. So, um, I, I mean, again, this is explained at length in the book, but I look forward to discussing some of this um, in the discussion that follows with, with the rest of the panelists. Thank you. I'm sorry if I've taken up more time than I should have. Uh, thank you, Anisha Ji. Uh, since uh, I don't know that you have been uh, associated with conservation projects and uh, also particularly with the Red Fort, its restoration, conservation. Uh, I mean, uh, but, but one of the problems with that fort, which uh, Anisha was also referring to when she was discussing the lat latter period of its history, is the large-scale destruction of the fort, and uh, uh, which makes it very difficult to uh, sort of get a sense of the, uh, the character of many parts of the fort and uh, 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 attempts at restoration uh, or conservation become even, I mean, this task becomes even more difficult in the case of uh, the Red Fort. So if you could just sort of... Uh, uh, help us understand some of these uh, problems and uh, which uh, conservationists face while, while uh, you know, trying to deal with this uh, fort. Yeah, uh, I hope I'm audible. Um, I'd like to begin by thanking Anisha as well as the um, United Services Institute of India 
and uh, for inviting me here. And uh, thank you, Dr. Farooqi, for asking this uh, question regarding the future of this military heritage. Uh, it is indeed a challenge to be able to interpret the multi-layered nature of the heritage resource, because we have to understand that what has been inherited by us, there are phases of its history which uh, cannot be uh, forgotten and in fact need to be foregrounded more than they are at present. Uh, Anisha's uh, work is, I, to me, as much of a landmark in architectural history as the World Heritage Site itself. It's 21 years ago, the first edition had come out, and as a consequence of that, there was renewed interest in how significant this particular heritage resource was. In 1983, the Agra Fort had been uh, nominated and designated as a World Heritage Site. However, uh, the Agra Fort, the Lahore Fort, the Ajmer Fort, the Allahabad Fort, they were constructed by Shah Jahan's ancestors and his interventions there were uh, sort of brownfield contextual interventions. In the case of the Red Fort in Shah Jahanabad, it was almost a completely greenfield project. It was very responsive to the environmental context, and that is something which Anisha has brought out through the analytical diagrams which she has made. So in response to Dr. Farooqi's question uh, regarding the interpretation of the heritage resource as we have it today, uh, I'd like to request Anisha to again uh, show the final map Can we, can we go back to the second last slide of Anisha's presentation? So while that's coming on, uh, perhaps you recollect the, the two layers which she has shown of the barracks superimposed, the barracks and the British military interventions superimposed on the Mughal uh, fort. So over the 21 years uh, since the book came out, in 2007, there was the preparation of a, a comprehensive uh, conservation management plan known as the CCMP. This was the outcome of a, a, a collaborative initiative between civil society. I can see some of the members uh, like Smita Makhija and Shama Chinoy sitting in the audience today who were involved in the civil society intervention, which related to the necessity for um, preparing a holistic conservation plan, which took into account the various layers of the heritage site. Um, this is something, it was quite a landmark uh, initiative. It was undertaken under a Supreme Court appointed committee. Uh, it resulted in the nomination and designation of the fort in 2007. Subsequent to that, there have been innumerable challenges which have confronted the ASI, and one of the ways forward which would be very beneficial if this earlier initiative, which was a kind of public-private partnership and uh, with the involvement of civil society, that is taken forward. So, uh, as we all know, um, last year the Department of Culture um, ensured that the barracks are used for public purposes, that the community, the larger community, the citizens of Delhi are able to access different parts of the World Heritage Site, use it for cultural purposes. A skill development center has been set up which would be beneficial for the restoration of different types of heritage resources which are there in the Red Fort, as well as will help to uh, engage the residents of Shah Janabad with conservation initiatives uh, regarding the World Heritage Site. These are all ideas which had emerged at the time the CCMP was being prepared, but it does take a, a period of time for it to be uh, uh, accepted and uh, taken forward. So over the last 17 years or more, there has been 
uh, there have been steps taken which will help in the long-term sustainable conservation of the World Heritage Site. Um, Anisha, very, interesting, very interestingly and almost sort of presciently, in 2003 mentioned three main issues regarding the conservation scenario. The, the site was nominated according to three different criteria regarding the syncretic, the syncretic nature of the heritage, the layers which are present on the site and the influence it's had on other uh, heritage resources, and the fact that it's a very important aspect of our national identity. But the values uh, can only be understood if we understand the other forts also, such as Ajmer, um, Allahabad, Agra. So Agra is a designated World Heritage Site. Allahabad Fort, interestingly, continues to be under the management of the military. So um, uh, I think Anisha's suggestions are in relation to uh, understanding the context and reintegrating the fort, making the fort relevant in the lives of the people of Shah Janabad, ensuring that the principles of sustainability, which are discernible in the planning, which she has shown through her really remarkable analytical diagrams, those are taken into account. I think all of us are aware of what happens during the monsoon, when uh, the river sort of reasserts its course. It goes back to its original course. It takes over Bela Road and Ring Road. And uh, uh, we, this is a consequence of the disruption of the hydrological system. Anisha has actually documented how uh, the original system was a collaboration between, um, say, IIT, which is looking into the hydrological and uh, sort of flooding issues uh, in Delhi, taking cognizance of the kind of research Anisha has done, the work which other people who are sitting in the audience have done, that is something which will ensure a more sustainable conservation and management tra uh, trajectory for the heritage resources of the Red Fort. So uh, I think there are many challenges, but uh, the ultimate uh, uh, conclusion which can be drawn is that something which is so complex can only be addressed through a collaborative initiative. So the ASI, the uh, military heritage uh, enthusiasts, historians such as Dr. Faruqi, and uh, the kind of rigorous research which uh, people like Anisha are doing, that is something which where all the institutions and individuals need to come together and uh, perhaps the next Indian Military Heritage Festival could actually take place within the Red Fort or the Agra Fort. So that I was very happy actually to see so many young people in the audience earlier. Unfortunately, they're not there right now. But I grew up from the age of eight, we used to have picnics in the Red Fort. I was a student in Presentation Convent. It was right across the road. It was a constant presence in our lives. And it's something which is very important to, I think, every citizen of India, because it's associated with independence. It's an iconic World Heritage Site. But uh, it needs to be seen together with the network of other forts, like, because all of them have immense value and seen together a sort of thematic uh, um, approach towards the nomination of these forts might be uh, one of the ways forward. So if we could actually nominate, in addition to the Agra and the Delhi Red Forts, if we could nominate Ajmer Red Fort and Allahabad Red Fort, I think uh, the, the value would be uh, multiplied many fold. We are actually, uh, you know, the next uh, speaker was supposed to be a representative of the ASI because um, unfortunately uh, he may be a little late. So <laughs> I don't. Uh, yeah, so uh, maybe we can sort of, there are issues which we can talk about uh, the uh, Dr. Singh. 
arrives. Uh, so, uh, there's something you want to, uh, to respond Sorry, to? Sorry, yes, to yes, to related. To, thank you, Anuradha, for, you know, for all that you've said. But there's one thing that I particularly wanted to speak about and related to collaboration. Um, for instance, if you go to the, you know, if you go to the Edinburgh fort, there is a, a war museum there which explains the role of the, I mean, I think it's a Scottish uh, National War Museum. And there's an opportunity in the, in the fort because you have these multiple layers. So first of all, as I said, there's a necessity to explain what these layers are and to communicate facets about each of these layers. And there's a wonderful opportunity for the barracks, for instance, at the moment. It's, it's very nice that they're being used as museums. But I think if, for instance, they could be used as museums to explain one, how they are there in the first instance, as well as the role of the Indian Army. Uh, that, makes, that makes the connections, you know, both with the history of the fort as well as with people so much clearer. Uh, so I think that's, that's one really, that's something that we could perhaps uh, aim to do. And the other thing I think is in the, you know, the connections with the people of Shah Jahanabad. So one of the things that I mentioned is that the fort, it's an urban fort. It was always connected to the city. And today it's like an island. So that's something, again, perhaps, which we could, you know, think of working on. Yeah. Uh, There's a uh, this point you make in, the, uh, in your book uh, where you cite... Uh, uh, some of the British officials uh, saying when the fort was being demolished after 1857, 1858 rather, that uh, uh, a large part of the fort had already sort of, uh, uh, it was no longer what uh, Shah Jahan had built. So it was uh, in a bad condition. It had uh, buildings had uh, this, uh, uh, were in a uh, you know, dilapidated state, and uh, those were some of the portions that they were really demolishing. I think you know it's important to. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, let's not be entirely dismissive of this uh, uh, statement because uh, 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 there were. Uh, I mean, what was demolished? A large part of it had actually come up uh, in the late 18th uh, and early 19th century, the place where the Salatin resided, very, very uh, sort of congested. You have a photograph in your book of uh, the building in which Bahadur Shah was uh, imprisoned, and that actually shows this uh, kind of uh, the structures which actually existed uh, in parts of the fort which uh, you call the uh, uh, the, the, public. The, pub, the public uh, uh, domain. So, uh, and, uh, uh, the other part which is actually uh, irrecoverable, uh, we don't even know what it looked like, was uh, with the, uh, the, uh, the uh, women's, uh, the interior of the palace and the women's quarters. But at the same time, uh, if, you, if one was to leave out the uh, the Mehtab Bagh, the Hayat Bagh, and uh, the, you know, those gardens, uh, the British weren't exactly uh, inattentive to the design of the court. One, they required the fort for uh, military purposes. So that was an important, it was not to be a residence of any imperial family, but it was uh, important for, uh, as, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, as a, uh, a fort, uh, which is one of the reasons why they made the esplanade, the clearing outside the fort. So, uh, but it's sort of uh, military uh, strengths was something that they were fairly attentive to. They are, uh, and uh, I think uh, the, uh, the the uh, the survival of the uh, imperial part, that is the Diwan e Khas, the uh, the Khas Mehel, the Hammams, uh, is uh, perhaps also related to the way in which the British themselves uh, uh, used the fort. They needed those spaces, and in fact, it's interesting that the Diwan e Khas, uh, which we always consider to be a place of grand darbars. Uh, was also an office, which I think you bring out its uh, functions as an office of the emperor. So emperor, with a large amount of administrative work, 
paperwork needs a space where you know the, that kind of work can be undertaken so um, uh, other than the days on which you would have the special darbar it's actually used uh, uh, as an office which is precisely what the british did when they took over the fort they uh, the diwan khas became the uh, office of the uh, military officials in in uh, the sort of principal military officials posted uh, in delhi so uh, perhaps uh, you know the point that i was trying to make was that maybe uh, you know instead of being entirely dismissive of some of these comments of course they come from a different kind of understanding but uh, nevertheless uh, instead of being entirely dismissive it might be worth looking at the the statements of uh, colonial officials in the late 50s early 60s about the use of buildings how they are using these buildings to be able to uh, retrieve some of uh, the history of the uh, fort okay so may i just quickly yeah. respond to this mm -hmm. maybe we'll just yeah, ask yeah. Yeah, rather yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah uh just in connection to what you are saying that uh, much of what was demolished during the british period was not of value if we consider the transformations and the gradual evolution which took place it is important to understand uh what was the what were the periods of rise and decline and it's a testimony to these kind of processes and uh, much of what was demolished was uh, of great value it was of great architectural and cultural value so uh, it is uh, as you say it's important to take cognizance of what the Uh, opinion of some of the british officials of the mid 19th century was but it's also important to recognize that there was retaliatory action very very problematic and uh, sort of repressive retaliatory action uh, which took place which resulted in the demolition of a great deal which was of immense historic and architectural value and i think anisha's book helps us understand that what was the degree of loss which took place the interesting thing is that the world heritage site nomination recognizes that each of these layers is of great significance and that it is problematic to be able to interpret some of the events which took place in the red fort and that the site today is actually part of a shared military heritage even so there are many uh, sort of levels at which the world heritage site has to be understood and in this context i'd like to say that forts such as the ilhabad fort and the agra fort also require the kind of analytical rigorous architectural history <laughs> which we thankfully have for the red fort today and we are constantly learning more about the red fort the asi is carrying out a lot of very scientific investigations and excavations on the site anisha's book mentions quite a lot of uh, elements which were discovered during earlier excavations which is mentioned in the excavation reports such as uh, subterranean uh, channels etc near the eastern wall linked again with the hydrology so these are all elements seemingly disconnected but which help us to piece together uh, a uh, a document which forms a very sound basis for the preparation of a uh, conservation and management plan for the future so uh, i just hand it to anisha anisha before that do, do, can we have uh, do we have time for just one or two quick questions uh, wait huh, so anisha yeah so quickly I, yeah, just yeah so anradas answered some of what i wanted to say but i just wanted to say that it was actually like an amputation what what was done to the fort so uh, and you know buildings were left standing without their context really and also there are records by british officials saying that this was set to validate the destruction but a lot of them could have actually stayed yeah so so maybe we we'll just yeah please i want to compliment you anisha on uh, a very in depth study but there are a few things which you seem to have left out so i want to suggest those to you firstly there is a slogan which says that he who holds the red fort will also 
holds sway over the rest of India, which was why it was relevant for certain kings to hold on to the fort. And this has held true till very recently. You might also like to consider the defensive aspects of this fort. You haven't talked about it at all. This fort has got many, many features of defense, which were, of course, uh, not utilized, but nevertheless, they are there in, that, in the design. You might also like to consider the fact, you brought out the fact that the British con constructed those barracks. If you stand at the uh, Diwani Arm and look around you, you see lovely lawns, beautiful lawns, but in the middle of all that are these very ugly buildings. Their siting has been planned with this in mind, that we need to put down the feelings of the general public towards the uh, emperor and everything else that he represents, which is why the, the planning for these buildings is precisely where they stand now. The same thing applies when Bahadur Shah Zafar's court-martial was conducted. His court-martial was conducted in the very spot where his throne was. And the constitution of the court indicated that they wanted to play him down. He called himself the emperor and they wanted to demean him by putting him down, by the very nature of the court which was held right there within the fort, in the Diwane Khas. All these facts you might like to consider as additions. Then the, the fact that few years back, there was a terrorist strike at the fort. What was the value of that strike? There was no purpose, no military purpose, except it was token that we, we can do pull down the Indian flag and that it is the red fort which represents so much for the Indians and that was why the flag was being attacked at the red fort. These are all military values. You might like to consider put adding them to your basic facts. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. I'm sure that uh, Nisha ji and uh, Radhan will be we'll consider some of these very valuable yeah, suggestions, points that you yeah. I haven't spoken about all aspects, but they are. So we uh, now have uh, Dr. Uh, Prabhin Singh from the Archaeological Survey of India. And uh, we've had a discussion on conservation, and we'll request him to say uh, so, uh, something about, uh, share with us some aspects of. Yes. I mean, so the, pro the, 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 prob the problems of. Uh, yeah, the challenges that you're facing. First of all, I thanks uh, Archana Ma'am who called me here. <clears throat> I'm not a very big scholar. I am working on the field. So there are lots of issues uh, while executing the conservation and maintenance of the monuments, especially in all over Delhi I am looking after. So conservation architect we have. We have a scholar from DU. We have a former uh, professor. So straight away I will come to the monuments, which, uh, especially in terms of uh, 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 Red Fort. So in last two years, Red Fort, we have taken few conservation, major conservation works. And uh, actually, what's happened, you know, that first when we start in ASI, because I have told you I am a field worker, so I will straight away talk in that term. So, you know, it is a, every monument have four to five hundred year old. So when we uh, look at the uh, uh, present conservation status of the monument, there are a lot of, lot of work need to be done on each and every part of the monument, which is practically very difficult in terms of manpower you have, in terms of funds you have, in terms of time given to you. Why I'm telling time given to you means uh, in, when you go to ancient period time, uh, they have some uh, process to do works. Suppose it is Irish work or inlay works, or any short of work, they have some, you know, they have some procedures. Suppose they want uh, slag limes, they want to put that slag limes for at least for uh, in water for 15 days or 10 days. And on the other side, system will tell you complete this work in 15 days. So this is one of the major uh, issues. 
uh, we are not getting the appropriate time to execute in present scenario and present society to take care of the monument. Now, secondly, we come to material. You know what happened due to the rapid urbanization in all over Delhi also, all over the world also. So we are not getting uh, proper material of that, uh, you know, that grain, and that quality, you know, that strength. Suppose uh, I'm giving one small example. We are working in Kirki Mosque here somewhere uh, in Saket nearby Malvi Nagar. They have some stones. It gives the impression of very uh, good quality of granite, but it is DQ, Delhi Quartz. But Delhi Quartz is not available now. Queries are banned by the government. So again, how we will get material? Because we can't compromise when archaeology is there, archaeology conservation is there, then we need that artisans also, the craftsmen also, the mason and bhistis and all people we need who can work as per ancient methodology. So that is one important thing. So we have to compromise the sometime material also. Color we will match, then we won't get strength in that. So in Redfoot also we have uh, observed many, many uh, things such as uh, an example we are taking one inlay work I have to take in uh, main uh, Diwane Khas. Diwane Arm, there is a some, in, sorry, Diwane Arm, there is a some inlay works has been done uh, right on the, the king is on the conch below there. So, but we are not able to take it. We are not getting that, you know, artisan. We have to take a uh, look at Agra, Makrana and all these places because there is a marble. Again, marble, we need Makrana. Again, then red sandstone, we have to go Agra and nearby places. Bansi Paharpur stone, we need. Again, in the, there is a lot of variety. So the thing is how to get the things in terms of physical material, in terms of artists, in terms of, you know, the artis artisans. So this is one another big issue. So third, uh, the, uh, how we, when we execute the work, we, mon we have monument. Red Fort don't have the, that much problem. We have light, we have, uh, you know, we have safe zone, we have CISF, nothing. But in other monuments, you know, uh, apart from Red Fort, when you go, we lot, need lot, we need lot of support from the district administration. So we have completed one work in between, uh, if you are familiar with Delhi, in between uh, Salimgar and uh, uh, no, Red Fort, there is a road. Earlier it was Yamuna. Earlier it was Yamna, now it is a red. A very busy road and we have to take work in that one small bridge is there. Where, uh, that is, we are calling it as Monkey Bridge, that is as Mackey Bridge. So Monkey Bridge, we have taken one arch, we have closed that and we have opened that after uh, making conservation works. But uh, we have to take permission from the uh, district authorities and especially traffic police to get it closed, then only we can execute the work. So it taken a lot of time. A lot of time means the work has to be completed in two months, it has taken more than six months. And later on, when we have completed the work, then again uh, in night, traffic are coming in full speed and uh, drunken drivers, and they are stri striking it again. So again, then we have to go to PWD, make some barrier so that they won't struck directly. So these are conservation issues, and once we have done it, how, after taking tender, quotation, this, that, and uh, however, you know, able to complete that, and again, within a 20 days, it has been struck twice and thrice. So this is a very practical problem I'm telling you we are facing in the ground, getting the permission to help us, especially on the monuments which are on the road. Uh, this is a part of Redford only because in the, that, that uh, definition only that uh, particular bridge has been covered in the Redford area. So when we move around in the fort, we are getting a lot of places and we have to be very selective. Suppose uh, one wall is there, is bulging out uh, like anything. So we have to take care of that. Same time, one dome is there, oh, it has a vertical horizontal crack, what to do that? So, which work we have to take? So, kiska life jada, uske hisab se fir ek aadmi ko oxygen pe chhod ke dusri chiz leni padti hai. So, we have done some good work in uh, uh, Jafar Mahal, in between Savan Bhado is a very pr prominent uh, small structure of marble. Uh, uska north side ka wall pura bulge ho gaya tha, usko khola tha, to practical problem ye bhi aati hai, jab aap execute karte ho, aapne estimate banaya hai, 50 lakh ka, aur kaam kar rahe hai, manu pada, 50 lakh kar, karne ke baad, arre yaar, ye hata ya, iska roof kharaab hai, iska wo kharaab hai, iska planks kharaab hai, to that also exceeds, so usme ek issue aata hai, ye, I am, I am very, you know, honestly speaking to you people, so the problem which we are facing at uh, ground only. It's a very big side. Haan, sir, uh, then again, uh, interference of the, you know, higher authorities also our own. You know, we ask for funds, that is administrative issues I am telling. 
तो एडमिनिस्ट्रेशन में होता है कि हमारा टेंडर जाएगा फिर उसको टेंडर आने में बहुत टाइम लगेगा फाइनेंस नहीं आएगा फिर फाइनेंस आएगा मैं ऑब्जेक्शन आएंगे यू नो दैट इज प्रैक्टिस आई डोंट वॉन्ट टू गो इन दैट क्रिटिकल वे टू माई ओन डिपार्टमेंट बट इज अ फैक्ट आई एम टेलिंग की बहुत इशूज होता है फिर लोग जो सामने हैं पब्लिक है या बिकॉज दे हैव दे हैव स्टेट वॉट यू पीपल आर डूइंग वॉट यू पीपल आर डूइंग यू नो अपार्ट फ्रॉम दैट प्रोटोकॉल्स हैं गवर्नमेंट की अपनी पॉलिसीज हैं उसको उसके जो वर्क उस, उनके जो प्रोजेक्ट्स हैं उस पर भी करना है कभी हम लोग को ट्राई कलर करना है भाई इलूमिनेट करिए कब नहीं नहीं सॉरी टू से बट आई एम टेलिंग बिकॉज वी हैव टू डाइवर्ट अवर होल टीम देयर यू नो तो आई एम नॉट क्रिटिसाइजिंग एन गवर्नमेंट और माई डिपार्टमेंट आई एम टेलिंग द प्रैक्टिकल प्रॉब्लम ऑन द फील्ड वी आर फेसिंग अबाउट सो नो इलूमिनेट करना है तो इलूमिनेट वी आर गेटिंग वेरी लेस टाइम तो वी हैव टू डू अ होल डाइवर्ट होल टीम टू दैट पर्टिकुलर प्लेस देन सम इवेंट हैज टू बी डन वी आई पी इवेंट सो दे आर चूज मोनूमेंट्स एज पर द प्रोविजन ऑफ अवर एक्ट वन दिस हैज बिन मोनूमेंट हैज बिन प्रोटेक्टेड देर वॉज क्लियर कट गाइडलाइंस आर देयर द यू शुड नॉट डू दिस एंड यू कैन डू दिस सो वैन दीज थिंग्स कम की वी वॉन्ट टू डू सम यू नो बिग इवेंट सो प्रोटोकॉल्स हैज टू बी दे आर सम प्रेसिडेंट ऑफ प्राइम मिनिस्टर और फर्स्ट मैन ऑफ सम कंट्री विल कमिंग एंड डूइंग दिस एंड दैट देन दैन अगेन दर इज एन इशू यू कॉन्ट से नो इन द सिस्टम बट इट अगेन हेम्पर द होल इंटायर सिस्टम ऑफ योर वर्किंग यू नो मैन पावर शुड भी डाइवर्ट और आपका काम वहाँ चल रहा है वहाँ रोकना पड़ेगा यहाँ डाइवर्ट करना पड़ेगा वो सब चीज़ें भी प्रैक्टिकली फील्ड में आती हैं Red Fort, ha, huh, because Red Fort is in a pride of every Indian. So when the uh, when we see our uh, flag on that, uh, when especially on 15th when it unfurled, so but we have to compromise somewhere. You know, we can't uh, help it out because you have, you can say, sir, we can't do this. You can tell to your sir, but he cannot. Everyone will not able to say on every channel. I can't do that. So we, they will say, no, please do something. We have to sort it out. This is one thing. Then sometimes we have the monuments. We don't have electrification there. वॉट ऑफ एफ प्रॉब्लम इज देयर सो पानी नहीं है बिजली नहीं है किसी मोनूमेंट पर रेडफोर्ट में नो डाउट देर इज अवेलेबिलिटी इशूज में प्रॉब्लम नहीं है लेकिन ये प्रॉब्लम भी फील्ड में आती हैं कि आपके पास पानी का कनेक्शन नहीं है या बिजली नहीं है तो फिर कैसे काम करेंगे तो बाकी चीज़ें तो शायद मेरे को आई एम आई एम वेरी सॉरी दैट आई गॉट आई वॉज एन इम्प्रेशन दैट दिस इज शेड्यूल्ड ऑन संडे सो आई वॉज स्लीपिंग आई एम आई एम वेरी सॉरी सो आई रश टू वेन आई गॉट द कॉल फ्रॉम दैट प्लेस Honestly, I'm telling. So I got uh, when I got the call, I, it was 12, uh, 2:30. Uh, that, uh, why you are not here? Uh, I, I forgot I was on Sunday, so I came uh, rapidly. Uh, so uh, there are some. I will take one or two minutes or more. So there are one more issues. This this is uh, that material we are using. So when you are uh, uh, making conservation of this one, then we use natural uh, the material which has been used in that time. So we have to go with the particular slag. that is uh, we have lime sorry we have to select a particular lime then uh, sand particular it is a fine scores or what sort of uh, adhesive you know connecting material of the stone and bricks has been utilized that has to be sorted out whether it is we have to brought it from out of outside delhi or whatever it is so it will also take time sometimes we query uh, we have to go on particular that query where uh, from where we can go get these stones then we have we have to use lot of things this belgiri molasses and belgiri सम बता सा उड़द की दाल भी हम लोग यूज़ करते हैं यू नो सन मार्बल डस्ट की पॉलिशिंग अलग है राइस वर्क में जरूरत है तो कोकोनट पाउडर हमको चाहिए तो ये जो टेक्निक्स से छोटी छोटी चीज़ें हैं जो मटेरियल हम लोग यूज़ करते हैं उसमें थोड़ा सा कई बार देर आर समाइम यू नो वी आर फेसिंग लॉट्स ऑफ इशू इन टेकिंग एग्जीक्यूटिंग द कॉन्जर्वेशन वर्क सो इफ आई विल गेट टाइम इफ दर्मिट यू नो दीपल परमिट भी आई विल शो यू फाइव टू सिक्स मिनट स्लाइड्स वॉट वी हैव टेकन कॉन्जर्वेशन वर्क इन दिस मिनट whenever whenever you permit this is a in-house i think it's a good uh, interaction with the people is it supposed to be with your uh, pen drive i have my pen so drive have you given it to them uh, not yet i'm just i, I have just arrived so yeah, if somebody can come and take the uh, pen drive from him so i think you know when some of the things that you've mentioned are related to issues of collaboration and the fact that the red fort is such a huge site so one of the things that we were also saying is that once the indian army is actually moved out uh, it's it's increased the responsibility of the asr and that's that's difficult because it's such a huge site so that you know we do notice that there's uh, kind of uh, it's it's not as it looks more decrepit in many ways so that's you know that that's a real problem with such a big site and uh, 
in fact, what the Aga Khan program did for whom I used to was that it got together a lot of different agencies, and perhaps that's also something to be considered. You know? Yeah. Uh, first of all, I'd like to express my gratitude to Dr. Singh for actually coming at such short notice. And it's, it's a really complex and challenging site because it is, like he said, it's the pride of every Indian. It's, uh, I think the, your works are showing. The ASI has taken on this responsibility, I think, very seriously. And it can only help if all of us support the ASI in the works that they are doing through the kind of research which our academic institutions do, the work which ICOMOS uh, does, the North Zone ICOMOS I know is very interested in assisting the ASI with resolving the issue regarding the periodic flooding which happens. So the SPA uh, School of Planning and Architecture now is also undertaking some academic work which should be of help in the future. So uh, I think the future uh, trajectory and uh, the kind of uh, sustainable conservation initiatives will only occur if we do this in a sort of collaborative mode, where researchers such as Dr. Faroqi and Anisha, who's got a very sound conservation and architectural historical background, professionals, institutions like ICOMOS, if we all work together, uh, look into the scientific validation of some of the uh, formulae, the ancient recipes for water, etc. So I think it's the future needs to be much more collaborative. Another aspect I'd like to bring out is that in the context of interpretation of the heritage values, as well as actual restoration of the material heritage of the Red Fort, uh, you know, the advances we have in terms of IT, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, all of these can come very handy in terms of assessing the condition of areas because even the length of the wall is so, you know, it's kilometers and the number of cells is thousands of cells. So we just see the exterior but we don't understand how much effort is going to it's going to take to actually restore such a vast and complex site. So uh, thank you, Dr. Praveen, for taking time. And if you can just run us through the works which have been uh, done by the ASI. Before that, uh, before that, ma'am, I will uh, talk in one minute more. Madam has told, uh, told about two things, the collaboration of the person who are involved in this particular field. Uh, again, this is a very uh, uh, good approach nowadays for the government also, society also, and nowadays it is a requirement of, of the monuments also. So that is a good thing, but it is a policy. Again, the, the headquarter and uh, higher authorities has to think, it, uh, think into. Think into. Next, uh, the second thing you, uh, you have told about, uh, you know, uh, SPA is, the, is a big team expert team we are uh, as far as my part is concerned whenever I, I have, from the time i have joined delhi circle every time i am giving without without any hesitation i am giving simple permission yeah do the execute the work do it planning ex do the measurements and give a copy to us so that it can be utilized when we do our conservation works so we are doing that ma'am uh, hope that it will increase day by day because uh, and second more thing again it is very critical from my side because you know we people i mean asi people archaeologists is the little very you know very rigid and very uh, orthodox sort of approach you know, but now we have to change it because what happened you know uh, i am telling you one example suppose uh, aktc aga khan trust is doing some conservation works no doubt when i am sitting that side it is a marvelous work ultimate works, you know, unparalleled work. It is completely, you know. But when we come to this side as an archaeologist, I am born and brought up and got educated in archaeology. So suppose one wall is there. Let me, I have to stand. You know, suppose I am uh, looking at this wall. I have some paintings or some merlons or some design. Uh, only 10% is there and 80%, 90% is not there. So I'm not going with that because we have taught in that, that sense. What are you have 10% that is ancient one, ancient one. So be hold of that. Don't do anything on remaining 80%. So, so, so what happened, you know, there is a, you know, mental ethical approach, difference hai. So we feel uncomfortable, lagta hai. to be honest. It feels uncomfortable if it's 10% with 10%, again, the remaining 90% we will, 
रिप्लीकेट दैट सो ये एक बड़ा इशू होता है जो हम लोग ना हर बार बैकवुड पर रहते हैं कि यार या तो रिजिडनेस हो या कंट्रोल हो जो भी हम लोग चाहे वो एस पी हो चाहे दूसरा कंजर्वेशन आर्किटेक्ट्स हो या दूसरा भी टीम हो जो इसमें काम करते हैं तो थोड़ा सा यहाँ डिफरेंस तो है लेकिन अगेन अप्रोच अच्छा है आज की रिक्वायरमेंट सोसाइटी की गवर्नमेंट की आज डिमांड है मोनूमेंट्स की कि अकेले हमसे नहीं होगा तो हमको इंक्लूड करना है एंड वेरी हैप्पी टू इंक्लूड ऑल दिस पीपल एंड दे आर हेल्पिंग अस लाइक एनीथिंग इट्स नॉट आई एम प्रेजिंग एनी वन बट इज अ फैक्ट आई एम टेलिंग वी आर गोइंग विद दैट अप्रोच ऑल्सो थैंक यू the slide will be shown there in the you know on the full screen yeah there one is no so this is the uh, so i will uh, i have some more slide in there but i will uh, skip some of the slide so this is the just basically uh, i have what i have discussed with you know this is the major conservation work we have taken in the recent two years uh, you know restoration of fallen wall and half dome i have told you there is a, i have not told you sorry uh, this is in between again uh, it is in salimgar other side of the red fort it was half dome structure and that half was also collapsed due to rain and thundering and lightning activities so we have completed that remained you know one fourth was only one fourth was remaining we have included that and we have completed up to half so we have not completed that's what i have just two minutes before i have told you i have not completed because we don't have that architectural you know uh, drawings and archival records we don't have so we have kept like this so one i can do quarter completion i can complete it also but we are not going with it but again because what happened in this particular i will show you one photograph what are the issues comes in uh, why conserving this uh, uh, half dome of uh, salimgar so jafar mal i have told you we have worked in jafar mal wall was bulged and then we were able to understand the wall, whole uh, this uh, roof is also in trouble so i have uh, sorted out then again conservation of arch bridge i was telling about everyone is uh, going there and, and you know striking the wall what we have done that that arches has again has been damaged so one then restoration of jali work of khas mail i have not told this is a very important work in terms of because it is very finely carved white marble jali it was damaged in from 60 30 60 to 70% it was damaged then people has to you know laser scanning and micro scanning has been done then individual parts for uh, there were then they should be placed on the particular monument it will take it has been uh, taken a lot of time so this type of work is also uh, uh, we can uh, think how what sort of problem we are facing in the while executing the work it seems very easy you know when it is highly ornate and you are doing uh, is now you have completed is good but uh, it, it takes a lot of efforts so again this is painting on chatta bazar when you, i don't know i don't know how many people have visited red fort five Three to four year back, and now. So when we have done the uh, uh, repair uh, renovation work of this, our chemical division has taken care of that work. And every year, what happened? You know, on every 15th August, whole thing has been uh, you know, lime coated. They have white washed all these things. So every year, it has you know coating, coating, coating. Lots of layer has been developed on Chhatta Bazaar top, right on the center. So when it has been removed layer by layer. we can able to understand ki how many layer has been prepared and we got original painting over there okay okay straight away okay then we uh, you look at the slide also i will not describe it so this is the material i have to already discuss what sort of material we need so this is half dome you can see the photo before and after i have just stated everyone can understand on the slide so uh, we have to utilize that you know hum log jisko hindi mein uple bolte hain cow dung ka bana rata hai usko bhi use kiya because dome ko proper shape dene ke liye humko uski zarurat padti hai otherwise us bahut rigid karke banayenge frame to uska dome ka profile proper nahi aayega to again is tarah ki cheeze bhi humko kafi delay ho jata hai ye half dome after completion wo aap dekh rahe hain left side mein khali quarter part reh gaya hai lekin right side mein usko karke quarter part aur add karke usko half dome ko half dome rakha hai इशू प्रॉब्लम अभी हैव ऑलरेडी डिस्कस्ड तो वी वोट गो इन दैट वन दिस इज इशू इंडिविजुअल इंडिविजुअल मोनूमेंट वाइज दिस इज डिस्क्राइब्ड दिस इज जफर मैल आई हैव टोल्ड यू वी हैव वर्किंग ऑन 
वॉल पार्ट एंड लेटर ऑन वी केम टू नो के वॉल इसका रूफ भी खराब है दिस इज ऑन गोइंग प्रोसेस दिस वॉज आई एम टेलिंग जस्ट नाउ वी हैव कम्प्लीटेड दिस मंकी ब्रिज राइट ऑन रिंग रोड एवरी वन इज कमिंग एंड स्ट्राइकिंग इट वी है बैरियर ऑल्सो वी है प्लेस देयर लेफ्ट साइड इट हैज बीन कम्प्लीटेड रिसेंटली ओनली हार्डली वन मंथ एंड सी दिस इज द पीपल वर्ड एवरी वन इज गोइंग स्ट्राइकिंग इट डैमेजिंग इट नो and uh, the single photo on right side you can see the again it has been striking strike strike the this one uh, upper arch part this was the jali wa i was telling about it some uh, you can see bu- uh, pure white is there then uh, dark part is there white one is new one which has been uh, c- uh, conserved as it is this is chatta bazar i was telling every time we are putting on you know white washing it and le- when we conserve it we were able to find the original painting on the top of the chatta bazar some short uh, small works when we go on ring road left hand side uh, there was some damaged uh, window shot of the, there we have removed uh, the uh, old one and uh, this one the small small parts is a huge structure lower part has been some damaged so only underpinning shot of work we are doing and removing removing that particular part and putting it there So this is lime era, lime and oh, i have told you 15 days we have put lime and all this thing until all the material has to be added and uh, do some uh, final coat on the like look like marble so major hurdles i have already told this is the one uh, 50, before 15th august there was a flood a flood came to that area and whole uh, area was like this it is a front right on the top of the this one uh, right side photo we are unfurling the our floor by pm and this is the solution sometimes we have to you know fight with this type of uh, situations also so this is barapula bridge recently lg has honorable lg has uh, taken care of this this was fully enclosed again this is a big problem while taking conservation works which has not done many monuments which has been taken care this is from uh, i am just giving a reference for this this is barapula uh, whole enclosure was removed and now we are conserving it after removing all this thing work is in progress thank you very much uh, taking uh, i'm sorry for taking more time Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Thank you to the entire panel. Um, we'll just want to g- give you a token of appreciation, and uh, then a group photograph. I'll give. Stand, stand. Stand here. <laughs> Come closer. <laughs> 